to Canaan's land. I'm on my way where the soul never dies. My darkest night will turn to day where the soul I prayed, and prudence was given me. I called upon God, and the spirit of wisdom came to me. This video in our series on the Christian life of virtue is a study of the cardinal virtue of prudence, practical wisdom. In earlier videos, I studied with you the uniquely Christian virtues of faith, hope, and charity. I now invite you to join me in studying the first of the primary, the four primary or cardinal virtues, which the pagan Greeks identified as prudence, justice, courage, and temperance. If the pagans saw these virtues as humanly acquired dispositions that render one self-sufficient and independently excellent, Christians view the cardinal virtues as profoundly relational. They are the fruit of our relationship with Christ. We grow in them as we grow in grace and as we are configured to the life of Christ. Thus, already the Book of Wisdom, which personifies wisdom, proclaims, if anyone loves justice, wisdom's labors are the virtues, for she teaches temperance and prudence, justice and courage, nothing in life is more profitable than these. The Book of Wisdom sees the cardinal virtues as the fruit of a disciplined instruction, paideia, that we acquire in relationship to God. This is why Solomon prays for wisdom. And notice he prays both for speculative wisdom and practical wisdom, Sophia and phronesis. I prayed and prudence, phronesis, was given me. I called upon God and the spirit of wisdom, Sophia, came to me. But immediately in our attempts to understand this tradition, we're confronted by the fact that in popular parlance, prudence has virtually come to signify the opposite of what phronesis in Greek or prudentia in Latin meant for the ancients. In popular parlance, the prudent person is the clever tactician who takes counsel of his fears and seeks only personal safety and private gain. In the classical tradition, however, phronesis or prudentia disposes us to act heroically, even unto death. It disposes us to do the courageous and just action at exactly the appropriate moment. This is why phronesis is best translated as practical wisdom. It is a knowledge, as Augustine explains, about what to desire and what to flee. But it is not speculative knowledge. It is a commanding practical knowledge that takes counsel and makes a judgment about what should be done here and now. Aristotle, for example, defines phronesis as a disposition entailing true reason, logos aletheis, about practical human goods. Thomas Aquinas, paraphrasing and summarizing Aristotle's definition, defines prudentia as right reason about action, or right reason about doable actions, recta ratio agibilium. To understand what this means, we must first look at speculative reasoning. Speculative reasoning entails a syllogistic reasoning, where we begin with a major premise, a general bit of knowledge, such as all dogs are animals, and then a minor premise that is more specific, Rex is a dog, and that leads to new knowledge, Rex is an animal. So major, minor, to conclusion, Rex is an animal. The practical syllogism is like the speculative syllogism, but instead of concluding to more knowledge, it concludes to action, or more literally, it concludes to a command from the intellect to do this that is executed by the will. We act by knowledge and love, by intellect and will, 
but we do it through this practical syllogism. So there's a general principle, a general primary or major premise, and that's based on the precepts of the natural law, the primary first principles of practical reasoning, but it's also concretized in more specific general rules. For example, uh, this is a, a common one, one should regularly eat apples. That is a, a general precept that guides many people's behavior. But in order to lead to action here and now, there needs to be a minor premise. This particular fruit is an apple, and it is a timely apple. So general premise, one should regularly eat apples. Minor premise, this is a timely apple, leading to the conclusion, which again is not leading to more knowledge, but to a command that is embedded in a action. The eat this apple, which leads the person to eat the apple. This shows how prudence has priority over and differs from conscience. The Catechism defines conscience as a judgment of reason, whereby the human person recognizes the moral quality of a concrete act he is going to perform, is in the process of performing, or has already completed. Now, this definition draws on human experience. We have all had the experience of something inside us as we're about to act say, saying to us, you shouldn't do that. Or while we're doing the action, you shouldn't be doing that. And then after the action is completed, you really shouldn't have done that. But that experience also points to the fact that although we can have the knowledge of conscience, we can act against that knowledge. That's why there is a judgment that is more important than conscience. It's the practical judgment that Aquinas will describe as the judgment of decision or the judgment of election. This is where prudence enters in. Prudence is the virtue that disposes us to make practical judgments that end in action that are according to conscience. Often, to explain the character of this practical wisdom, prudence is compared to art. The excellence of practical wisdom is similar to artistic excellence. To do the kalos, the morally beautiful act, in the kairos, in the critical present moment, is analogous to doing the artistically beautiful act at the right time. So the dancer, the person who has the artistic excellence of being a dancer, knows where to place his foot or her foot at that critical moment in the dance. And notice here that these are communal, collective activities. The basketball player knows what to do at the critical moment in the company of his teammates to obtain the goal of winning the game. And the dancer, with his or her dance partner, knows what to do, how to do it at that critical moment. So the excellence of art is like the excellence of the practical wisdom we call prudence. But there's this difference. I can have artistic excellence and be an excellent dancer or an excellent ball player or an excellent carpenter without being a good person. In order to be a good person requires well-ordered love. Even the pagans recognized this. You find Aristotle saying that as a person is, so does the end appear to him. And for Aristotle, who we are is shaped by our loves. And that's why Aristotle affirms that prudence requires, phronesis requires the presence of what he describes as the moral virtues, the virtue of justice that rightly orders the affections of the will, and courage and temperance that rightly orders the passions. Those three virtues are necessary in order for us to have rightly ordered loves that are necessary for the judgment of prudence. If that's true on the general natural level, it's doubly true for the prudence that Christians experience in their life with Christ. Christian practical wisdom requires charity, not just justice, courage, and temperance, but the love of God and the love of neighbor. This is why Augustine will describe prudence as love discerning a right, that which helps from that which hinders us intending to God. And Aquinas explains this as follows. Love is said to discern because it moves reason to discern. And so prudence is described as love because love causes prudence's discernment. 
This is why conscience and prudence find their deepest meaning in relation with our intimate apprenticeship with Christ. Cardinal Newman beautifully describes conscience as the aboriginal vicar of Christ, that in nature and in grace he speaks to us behind the veil and also teaches us and directs us through his ministers, through his representatives. And this is why, like all excellences, we grow in prudence in the context of a community, in the context of our family, in the context of a larger community, and through those voices of authority and those examples of Christian love and Christian life. This is also why prudence requires and depends upon the gifts of the Holy Spirit, specifically the gifts of wisdom and counsel, because it is by being receptive to the action of the Spirit that we can judge aright. Before prudence moves us to command an action, we first take counsel, and then we judge what is the best course to take. The gift of wisdom and the gift of counsel, animated by charity, move us to act according to God's wisdom and love because we are moved by the Spirit. We too, therefore, along with Christians of every generation, can join our voices to the voice of Solomon in his grateful meditation, I prayed and prudence was given me. I called upon God and the Spirit of wisdom came to me. Dear friends, there'll be no sad farewells, there'll be no tear-dimmed eyes. Where all is joy and peace and love and the soul of